Good morning, everybody. If we could uh, get started here. Happy Pride. Oh, wait, that's the next one after this. Yeah, I'm sorry, I don't want to get mixed up. So, uh, in any event, my name is uh, Mike Lawler. I used to work here, and I've been uh, asked to MC in effect uh, this morning's uh, celebration of the 30th anniversary of Connecticut's assault weapon bill, third in the nation. And I thought I would begin uh, by providing some brief historical context. For those of you who can't remember 30 years ago, many of you weren't even born at that point, uh, but it was a very different time when it comes to public policy related to firearms. Um, just so you can appreciate the difference between then and now, uh, crime was really out of control in the early 1990s. It really was. Notwithstanding what you hear today, it was much higher. For example, in the early 1990s, Connecticut had twice as many murders as we have had in recent years. So more than 200 a year back then, about 100 a year now. So just to give you some context, and people were very focused on solutions to the violence problem in our country, including here in our state. And uh, also at about the same time, um, it's important to understand that elsewhere in the country, this new phenomenon of this uh, M1 military rifle knockoff, which we've come to know as the AR-15, uh, was beginning to gain popularity. And it was being deliberately marketed, including by Connecticut manufacturers like Colt, who made the Colt Sporter. And uh, this was starting to grow in popularity. The uh, AR, uh, AK-47s were being imported from China, and they were showing up on the streets and being used in crimes. And as a result, uh, legislators here in Connecticut and around the country were trying to get their arms around what this problem really was and what might the solutions be. So California was the first state in the nation to ban assault weapons in 1989. New Jersey followed suit in 1990. And it was that year, 1990, when Connecticut uh, introduced its first bill to ban assault weapons in our state. Now, as you might imagine, back there, there was a lot of drama related to gun policy, not unlike today. And that bill met fierce resistance in the 1990 session of the legislature and did not uh, become law. Um, in, also in 1990, a new governor was elected, Lowell Weicker, and he was committed to fighting gun violence. And in 1993, for the first time, it appeared that there might actually be a realistic possibility to pass a ban on assault weapons. So let me acknowledge one thing right up front, that Connecticut's Constitution, as well as the United States Constitution, says that every citizen has the right to bear arms in defense of himself and the state, for sure. And we are reminded of that repeatedly. But it doesn't mean you can't regulate access to firearms or what you can do with firearms. Uh, I do recall vividly the testimony of people before the Judiciary Committee in opposition to all of these laws. And one thing that stood out in my mind then and now is that many of the opponents of these proposals said things like the reason these protections are in the Constitution is so that we as individual citizens can protect ourselves against the government if we feel the government has become tyrannical. And that was kind of scary, that the idea that people thought this right was so they could take up arms against the elected government in this state, in this nation, to solve a political problem. And in the background of my mind, all of these years has been that concern, which we saw actually manifest itself at state capitals around the country in recent years. Um, so, what happened in 1993, I think as sort of a student of politics too, as well, as well as a practitioner of it, was a textbook example of how to get a very complicated proposal through in a complicated legislative process. It's impossible to overstate the complexity of what went down in 1993. And it's also impossible to overstate the significance 
of what went down in 1993. And we're joined here today by a number of people who were direct participants in that process. Um, the process that I'm about to describe, not in all its detail, but just to give you an idea, uh, <laughs> is I think uh, an example where Connecticut has led the charge on so many controversial issues, whether it's choice, mm -hmm. or marriage equality, mm -hmm. or um, uh, the death penalty, right? I mean, we've made some major policy changes against all odds based on a very elaborate uh, uh, process. And I want to begin by saying that in addition to the people in front of you today, there are other people here who played a role in that process. And I'd like to give a shout out to Kim Harrison over there. Yay. Uh, Kim, uh, in case you don't know, Kim began lobbying here in 1983. So this marks her 40th year. And she's retiring at the Cine DA gavel next Wednesday. And, and aside from legislators who have a lot of feathers in their caps of things they've accomplished, you know, Kim has many as well, including this one. And, um, and there were so many other people who in the community helped develop support for a proposal that was meeting fierce resistance every, every step of the way. Uh, we're also joined now uh, by Bob Godfrey, who in some ways it was his fault to get the ball rolling in 1993, uh, because Bob was one of the first introducers of this legislation that year. And uh, the bill that was introduced followed a very circuitous route through the legislature and was not the bill that actually ended up being enacted, even though that bill went through four different committees and people through every landmine imaginable in its way. So, Bob, did you want to say something briefly to mark your uh, uh, participation? Mark, mark my participation. There you go. Thank you, Mike. Uh, it, was, has, it has always been a delight working with uh, Mike. We've become good friends over the years. And certainly this is an issue that we shared a passion for. And we had started a few years earlier. Uh, back in 1989, the first year I had uh, been uh, elected in, into, the, into the General Assembly, uh, Pete Smith uh, approached me. Uh, and uh, had an idea about treating military-style assault weapons the same way as we treat pistols, requiring a permit to carry. And we put together a coalition with then-representative Marty Looney, uh, who was kind of the veteran, a couple of, couple of freshmen, and a Republican, uh, Chris Burnham from, from Stanford, who later became treasurer, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, we actually got uh, the uh, whole idea uh, into an amendment that passed like 125 to something. Uh, and, and unfortunately, the, the bill had to be uh, tabled. But uh, then the following year, we had six kids die because their parents, mostly, failed to store their pistol. Uh, six kids that summer, and one of them was DJ Kenny down in uh, Naugatuck. Uh, he was playing after school with a friend across the street from his house. The father was a special cop and left his loaded pistol on top of the refrigerator. Death ensued. Uh, happily, the silver lining to this very dark cloud was his mother, Susan, who campaigned strenuously to make negligent storage of a firearm a crime. And we succeeded in doing that. Uh, and I have to say, since then, we haven't had that kind of carnage. Yes, there's been uh, incidents, and certainly we had to tweak that law um, uh, a year or so ago uh, with Ethan's law, so DJ's law and Ethan's law. But that, be, that was the first gun responsibility, we call it gun control at the time, uh, bill that had been passed since World War II. And it created the momentum uh, that, uh, has, had res that resulted in the military style assault weapon ban and all of the subsequent gun responsibility bills that we've done since. And, and interestingly, I remember at the time, Sarah and Jim Brady yeah. uh, actually came to Connecticut. You, you might remember Jim had been President Ronald Reagan's uh, press secretary. And when uh, the assassination attempt on the president occurred, he's the one who got hit and very seriously uh, injured. And, and they, they went 
they, were, they became incredible advocates, and they came to Connecticut uh, and worked with us. And one of the things they told me that I think was fascinating, the demographic most in favor of gun responsibility laws are white suburban Republicans. <laughs> and uh, we took that and said, well, we know who we're going to go talk to and try and put votes together to, uh, to, to get this done. And, uh, and, and it evolved. I'm, actually, I'm glad that we lost that uh, permitting bill because it actually wound up being a ban. And, uh, and I remember getting very ill <laughs> when we were going to bring it out because I was uh, doing other stuff. And Mike, uh, thank God, uh, was there to, to pick up and, and do the lead on the, uh, on the action of uh, bringing the bill out. Thank you for that, sir. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I can't believe it's been 30 years. It has been. <laughs> and I, I had a full head of hair before that night, yeah. actually. And, and, mine, and, mine, and mine was black. There you go. <laughs> so um, there came a time in the House when, thanks to the wisdom of former Speaker Tom Ritter, uh, that the, the issue was joined in an irrevocable way. The, the Bob's bill had been derailed in the committee process intentionally by those who sought to, yeah. to put landmines in the way. Uh, but Tom came up with the plan that we would e-cert the bill. Those of you who are familiar with the process right here know how this all works. And, uh, but he said, we're going to do it on a Saturday night, and, but we're going to start by having a vote on a motion to table. And uh, I have a very vivid memory of this, right? Yes. Uh, the, I had to stand up and say, okay, I introduced the bill, but I'm going to now move to table the bill, and I'm going to vote against that motion. And then Tom explained to people that if you're in favor of having the debate tonight, vote no. And if, you're, if you want to go home, vote yes. <laughs> and that's a powerful incentive sometimes, especially <laughs> late on a Saturday. Uh, and so the vote was called. It's not debatable. They have the vote. And the result of that vote was 71 in favor, 71 opposed. And because it was a motion to table, it failed on a tie vote. And with that began this debate. This is the transcript of that debate. <laughs> oh it went all night. It began at 7.39 p.m. with the vote to table. It ended at... 3.44 a.m. with the final vote. Uh, the bill passed 83 to 63 with uh, five uh, no-shows. During the course of that debate, there was 10 amendments adopted, two defeated, two withdrawn, and there was a motion to refer it to the Judiciary Committee, which failed, fortunately, right? <laughs> so uh, that was quite an ordeal. <laughs> And one of the people who gets a participation pro, uh, trophy for being there and sitting through that is our current Lieutenant Governor, uh, Susan Beiswitz, who then was a member of the House of Representatives. A relatively new member, but you still have the purple art to show for it. I believe. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, and good morning. And I'm happy to be back with old band members that are still young. Uh, to celebrate the 30th anniversary of the assault weapon ban. So in 1993, I was a state representative representing Middletown, Durham, and Middlefield. Um, and I was on the Judiciary Committee. And I was there with my daughter, Lena, for very long public hearings. My daughter was six months old at the time. And you can see here her there. She was sitting in my lap. And I still remember this. She was a model citizen, <laughs> didn't say a word. And people would talk. And she would look at the person talking. Someone else would talk. She was following the debate. And this picture was in the Hartford Current. And uh, she is 29. I can't believe she's turning 30, um, which is amazing, right? Because we're still 29. Yes. Uh, she is turning 30 in December. I was very proud as a state representative uh, and as a mom to cast that vote uh, in favor of the assault weapon ban. And it wasn't easy. 
because uh, I had a lot of constituents in Middlefield and Durham that belonged to gun clubs and were lobbying me extensively to vote no, and they said I would lose um, if I voted in favor of the ban. Um, and then after that, I was very proud to get more votes than Bill Clinton. Um, but anyway, um, I'm pleased to be here with my brilliant colleagues uh, who were part of this. Uh, and it's amazing to be here with uh, George Jepson, who went on, as you know, to become Attorney General, and with uh, Mike Waller, who is now a national expert in uh, criminal justice uh, reform. Uh, and they, and Senator Looney, and so many of our other colleagues, Bob Godfrey, um, helped make Connecticut a national leader uh, in gun safety legislation. And we knew this would be true in 1993 when we passed the ban. We knew that uh, safer, that our state and our country would be safer if we did it. And there was a study, a federal study in 2019 uh, that found that during the federal government's 10-year ban on assault weapons um, in 1994, mass shooting fatalities were 70% less. So that is a message to our United States Congress. And we know that we are a safer state because of the assault weapon ban and because we have continued to lead. And here we are uh, at a moment when there have been more mass shootings than days in the year thus far in our country, 268 mass shootings, according to the Gun Violence Archive. So we still have an epidemic of gun violence in our country. And even though our laws are strong in Connecticut, there is more to do. And in fact, uh, the governor and I have put forward a proposal that has been voted on uh, by the House, and hopefully it will be voted on in the State Senate, which closes loopholes that have developed over the years in our assault weapon ban, and also expands our safe storage law, our Ethan's law, protects the victims of domestic violence who all too often are killed with guns, and it also limits ghost guns. So I hope that our State Senate will follow the lead of our state house and swiftly pass this bill because we've made progress, but there is still more to do, so let's get to work. Thank you. Um, I think it's important to emphasize that uh, although there are partisan aspects to this kind of a philosophical battle, uh, this was a bipartisan vote. A number of Democrats voted no, a number of Republicans voted yes in the House. One of those uh, Republicans uh, is with us today, former Representative Mark Nielsen over here. Thank you, Mark. Uh, it, it, this wasn't an easy choice for anybody, as you just heard from the Lieutenant Governor. I, and I think some of my best all-time death threats came shortly after this. <laughs> Still have the recording of some of them, actually. Uh, but in any event, um, The, it's important to emphasize that even though this bill got through the House, it was late in the legislative session. There was many opportunities to derail it. Uh, fortunately, uh, the leadership in the Senate, uh, John Larson, our current congressman from the first district, was president of the Senate at the time, and like Speaker Ritter, he made sure this was called. Uh, the charge was led, of course, by George Jepson, uh, our special guest this morning, but one of the key allies in making that happen was someone who had recently come from the House to the Senate, my state senator, my neighbor, uh, and, and the, the, together with me, perhaps one of the class historians, or Bob, one of the class historians of this whole operation, uh, Senator Looney, please. Uh, Thank have you, Mike. <laughs> 
Thank you so much, Mike. Uh, going back to, yes, uh, remember in my uh, service in the, in the House, I was there from 81 to 92 and working closely then with uh, then Representative Lawler and then Representative Jepson before he came, went to the Senate term ahead of me and uh, Representative Godfrey and Representative Smith on that 89 and 90 effort uh, to try to pass something in the House. I remember there were, <clears throat> there were newspaper ads taken out against us at the time. We got yep. a higher profile in that bill than we had on almost anything, uh, anything else. But uh, the, uh, I was proud to be involved in that. Then, of course, in 93, uh, Mike just told you about the, uh, the drama there, and I'm sure George will add to that on the Senate side. He was chair of the, uh, the Judiciary uh, Committee in his uh, uh, second term in the Senate starting in 93. I was in my first term. Uh, at the time after six terms in the House. But the Senate vote was uh, 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 as dramatic as the House vote in that it ended in an 1818 tie. And as, uh, uh, as Mike said, it was a bipartisan vote. There were uh, 14 uh, Democratic senators who voted yes and four Republicans who voted yes. And on the, uh, on the no side, there were uh, five Democrats who voted no uh, and 13 Republicans who voted no. So it was an 1818 tie. Uh, in the Senate, and Lieutenant Governor Rourke broke the tie. Uh, afterwards, uh, was, uh, a reporter, an enterprising young reporter, went up and asked her if that was the, the most important vote she had cast that session. And she said, it's the only vote I've cast this session. <laughs> and it was certainly important. You know? so, uh, but uh, that night, there was a, a great deal of, of drama. I recall at the time, uh, George may recall this uh, as well, that uh, Bob Gennario, the senator for Norwalk at the yes. time, his wife was about to give birth. Uh, that night he got word and uh, he got requested of his colleagues that we kind of speed the debate up a little bit so he could get back to Norwalk. And we were, of course, uh, on this pro side of the debate, certainly happy to accommodate him because we knew he was one of the Republicans voting yes uh, on the bill. So that happened and uh, got his vote in. And then uh, as the bill was, as the discussion was going on, Mike mentioned the, uh, the death threats. Uh, my wife, Ellen, and Bill Aniskovich, who was another Republican yes vote, uh, both of our wives got calls around the same time from somebody who said, uh, whatever the outcome of the vote tonight, your husband is a dead man. Uh, so those calls came into the Capitol Police, uh, and then the Capitol Police called the New Haven Police or, and the Brantford Police where Bill lived. And I must say, that night, I think, is the only time in 42 years that I've been here that I abided by the speed limit all the way home because the State Capitol Police were following me all the way home. <laughs> <laughs> And, <laughs> and, and when I got home, the uh, New Haven police were in my driveway. The Capitol police uh, wouldn't let me get out of the car until they took a huge flashlight and went all the way around the, the house to check out the bushes before I got out of the car. And then the New Haven police car was uh, stayed, in, stayed there all night. Same thing was happening in Brantford at, at Bill Aniskovich's house. So uh, there was no follow-up, thankfully, by the threat, by the person who made the threat, and uh, uh, no arrest was ever made. But that was uh, uh, one of the most exciting times uh, I can recall, except uh, Two years earlier, I recall getting a threat that somebody was going to burn down my house during the income tax debate in 91. But, uh, <laughs> but that wasn't a direct threat to kill. That was only property damage. But, uh, <laughs> but, in, <laughs> but in any case, that, that uh, passage of that bill was, was uh, historic. It put us in the forefront of the nation. Um, and uh, unfortunately, we had to lead the nation again uh, 20 years later in 2013. Um, after Sandy Hook when we passed the updated uh, version. And this year, um, uh, one of the highest priority bills that is on the Senate calendar right now from the House um, is, the, uh, uh, is the gun bill for, for this session. And I want to thank the governor especially for his leadership uh, in offering that at the start. Thanks so much. And it's worth noting you heard reference to former Senator Bob Gennario, who did actually leave that night for the birth of his child. That same child was married last week. <laughs> so how does that make you feel? <laughs> but anyway, um, in any event, it, it was quite an event. Uh, what I would like to do now is ask you to join me in watching a short video so you can see how much older everyone has gotten. Uh, fortunately, I'm not in, in this video. Uh, but this is uh, uh, part of the coverage of the vote in the state Senate that night, the final passage of the bill. And it is law. This was a vote for our children and against the NRA. Senate debate on the bill was cut short to allow Senator Gennario to help his pregnant wife through labor. The finale is 18 to 18, and the chair cast one vote on. The it's been uphill all the way. As I pointed out, it survived seven one-vote margins to win. I've never seen a bill in seven years in the legislature 
uh, come so close to being wrecked. Those of us who make the laws ought to listen to those who have to enforce the laws. And that's what it came down to. The assault weapons bill carries some stiff penalties. The death penalty for using an assault weapon in a crime is now added to the list of aggravating circumstances. An eight-year mandatory prison sentence for the use, threat to use, display while committing a class A, B, or C felony. And those possessing an assault weapon must have it certified with the state by July 1st of 1994. The Senate bill, like the House version, names as many as 50 assault-type weapons, including the AK-47 and the Colt Sporter. Disgruntled, Colt workers left the chamber as the Senate voted to put the local-made weapon on the list. It's very disturbing that at the same time the legislature is voting tens of millions of dollars to bail out jobs at Pratt & Whitney, they're taking hostile action against the thousand employees over at Colt. Those fighting for tougher gun controls say this vote now sends a signal to the nation. The message tonight from Connecticut sent to Washington, D.C. is that NRA means not relevant anymore. Lawmakers say the assault bill will have its biggest impact in urban centers like New Haven, Hartford, Waterbury, and Bridgeport. I think it goes a long way to assisting our police departments in, uh, in uh, fighting crime in our neighborhoods. I think it's a, a first very critical step in a rational gun policy for the state. But the signing of the assault bill, it may seem to many lawmakers that the 1993 legislative session is over. But it's not. It still has several more hours to go and several more bills to go through before the final gavel comes down. In Hartford, I'm Kevin Hogan, Action News 8. There you go. And uh, it's worth noting, uh, journalists played a big role in this because uh, this is how the message got out, how it was communicated. And uh, not unlike the income tax debate a couple of years prior to this, I mean, it created a lot of drama for all of us who were members of the legislature. And there is one other journalist here with us today that was there, Mark Pazniokas, uh, covered this extensively back in the day when he worked for the Hartford Current. <laughs> okay, this was before Ken's time. Um, Am I correct, Ken? Yeah, I know. You're not old like the rest of us. <laughs> Congratulations. There you go. So anyways, um, and, and I just want to mention another one irony from the House vote, or two actually. Um, one of the staunch opponents of the bill was seated next to me for the whole debate. It was Richard Tulisano, who at the time was the chair of the Judiciary Committee, and there, there was a fair amount of negative energy that evening between the two of us. So. Uh, and also another irony is one of the leading uh, opponents of the bill uh, was a Republican state representative from uh, Wolcott, who uh, not long after this was defeated by an upstart young Democrat named Chris Murphy, who fast forward oh, yeah. uh, stewarded a major uh, accomplishment in terms of reasonable gun uh, recognition, uh, gun control, uh, last year, so, uh, and, and, you know, that was Chris's start. Well, he was an intern, I think, in the Capitol before he ran for the state legislature, so it's, he worked for the Senate. It makes us, all of us feel like losers, except for the governor, because <laughs> you've made it to the pinnacle too, right? Uh, but in any event, and there's two other former senators who've joined us today. Uh, Ken Prisby, where's Ken? In the back here. He voted yes, right? You did, right? <laughs> and and uh, former Senator Tony Harp, where's Tony? Hi, Tony. Also the former mayor of, of my town, New Haven. So uh, with that, George has had a lot of time to get his thoughts together here and get his talking points. And so <laughs> let me introduce, uh, in many ways, the person who actually was able to take the bill on that final step through the state Senate. It was an ordeal. It was a tie vote, as we said. Uh, but ladies and gentlemen, former senator, former representative, former attorney general, George Jepson. And I, th and I thought this was going to be a meeting about SB7. <laughs> yeah, um, and, and Mike is right. Uh, this, this, this did give me an opportunity to gather my thoughts a little bit. And I just want to stress um, a handful of items, some of which are, are redundant. First of all, this was a remarkable collaborative effort. Um, I referenced on the screen, uh, it, it survived seven different votes by, mostly in committee, obviously, by a single vote. And I can guarantee you two days in front of any one of those votes, we were still short on votes. We were scrounging votes um, just, just uh, desperately. Uh, one, of the, 
one of the interesting, and I'm, I'm going to mess up my history just a little bit. Uh, there was a procedural vote in the House, and we had two or three um, legislators who, who wanted to, who had committed to vote for the final product, but not on the procedural vote. And we had a couple of uh, an equal number of legislators who um, were committed to vote against the final product, but we were able to persuade them to vote with us on the procedural vote. And so um, and it, just, it was that kind of uh, you know, uh, effort that made it all, all possible. And it was bipartisan in a way that uh, it's still, still in Connecticut, bipartisanship sur survives, but uh, in a way that really doesn't exist in so many parts of our country today. And so on the one hand, 30 years ago, it feels like it was just, uh, you know, it was before my younger son was born, but um, it feels like yesterday in many respects, but, but there's also been a profound change in our national politics uh, in that ensuing time, just profoundly different. Uh, great leadership from Lowell Weicker and the Lieutenant Governor. Um, we, um, uh, bipartisan support and uh, a lot of hard work. I'd also say, just make the point uh, that that smart gun safety legislation really does work. Uh, gun deaths in Connecticut are measurably lower than the national average. We're one of the nation yep. leaders in that respect. Uh, and not just uh, assault weapons, but Mike and I and Bob and Marty and others, Susan, collaborated on other legislation as well over the course of a short number of years, including uh, background checks, gun sales at, uh, at, um, at uh, uh, black market sales have to be uh, reported. Uh, the first red flag law in the country, which uh, those who opposed it at the time said it would be neighbors turning in neighbors. Uh, th that law has worked tremendously uh, and uh, been used hundreds and hundreds of times uh, in not, uh, not infrequently in the context of, of, uh, of, of schools, mostly in the context of domestic violence. Uh, it has clearly saved lives uh, across Connecticut. Uh, the assault weapons ban, and, and, and it has been a model for legislation nationally, as was the assault weapons ban, which uh, led to President Clinton uh, uh, leading the charge to enact a national federal ban. Unfortunately, it was grandfathered after 10 years, and so it's no longer the law. But that, that has brought uh, a measure of gun safety uh, nationally for those 10 years. And so I uh, just uh, like to close by scolding my wife for <laughs> putting this together but, uh, and son. Uh, but it's a, it was a remarkable uh, piece, small piece of history to be part of. Mike is right. Uh, the, the debate in the House did run, uh, started at 7.30, and they did, did it at 7.30 because they knew that it would probably take all night. And as I did, uh, <laughs> darn it. <laughs> uh, and uh, as frequently, the, 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 this was true not just of the assault weapons ban, but other gun legislation as well. And, and uh, in the Senate, we could get out of debate in just a couple hours. In the House, we knew it would be going all night. And so I would routinely call Mike uh, when he was taking out one of these bills to wish him luck and to remind him that I just put a steak on the grill and open a <laughs> bottle, a nice <laughs> bottle of red wine. So. <laughs> yeah, George and I had some adventures that year. I, I recall we went to Bristol. You remember that? Yeah, we that went was, to that's where we got meet to with all the, the, the yeah. firearm enthusiasts who were very enthusiastic to greet us. We had to deal with their questions. and. Another time we went over to the state police rifle range and fired these AR-15s yes. just to demonstrate how they worked and how they, you know, if you're just watching, it looks like a machine gun being fired. There's plenty of press uh, that I enjoyed that, right? But uh, yeah, and uh, it's quite a thing. But in any event, 
as George just mentioned, the fact that Connecticut passed this law in 93 really opened the door for more progress. It showed legislators that you could come up, you could vote in favor of these proposals, and you could survive politically. Uh, the following year, Governor Weicker, to his credit, introduced a very ambitious uh, proposal in the aftermath of a shooting in New Haven where a, uh, children in a school bus were driving down the street and got caught in a crossfire be, be involving gun violence. And that's the first time Connecticut required a permit for anyone to buy a handgun. And in the aftermath of Sandy Hook, uh, Governor Malloy proposed a very wide-ranging yeah. Series of proposals extending that permit requirement to long guns and and even to purchasing ammunition, and I, I want to emphasize this because this bill that we're talking about today was the beginning of a process where we could adopt reasonable bipartisan and every one of these bills were bipartisan bills that helped reduce gun violence in our state, and to this day, as George just mentioned, the states that have done laws like we have. Massachusetts, New York, and New Jersey, the four states, we are consistently in the bottom five states nationally in gun-related deaths. And, and I think that's a, that's a, that's something we should all take great pride in. And so the good news is, as you heard briefly, is that the legislature, the state senate in this case, has another opportunity to continue this progress, ideally later today, but certainly later this week. And we have to give a lot of credit to Governor Lamont for initiating this process. It's a, uh, you know, when, they first, when his office first shared it with me, I said, this is extraordinary. It's the same way I felt when I read the proposals that were emerging in the legislature uh, after the Sandy Hook tragedy. And, and it is important to understand that even though we have really solid, comprehensive laws, there are people who s try to exploit the loopholes. In the Sandy Hook massacre, the weapon that was used was legally purchased by that kid's mother, a Bushmaster, which had been heavily advertised by Remington, saying, earn your man card, buy one of these things. And Remington was held accountable for that in court in a first in the nation example of this. And more recently, the, the last time one of these weapons was used to commit a murder, involved the murder of two Bristol police officers just last year by a gun that was legally possessed because it had been grandfathered in one of the earlier things. So that's just a reminder of how important it is to focus on closing the loopholes that still exist even in our state. But the ideal resolution to this is if every state would adopt Connecticut's laws, there'd be a lot less oh, yeah. uh, firearm deaths in our country, right? I mean, there are way more guns in circulation then there are responsible gun owners. And the goal of public policy should be to narrow that gap. And so once again, thank you, Governor Lamont, for your proposal this year. And let me turn it over to you to close out our, our testimony. Hey, thank you, Mike. And thank you for inviting me to this uh, very important reunion. Um, uh, George, you may say 30 years ago feels like yesterday. Doesn't exactly look like yesterday. <laughs> um, Mike was a shaggy-haired hippie at the time, and Susan, a young mom, and Bob and Marty were young whippersnappers in the legislature. Uh, I was pulling cable TV wire. Uh, but I am, oh, Diana, let me tell you something about a surprise guest. We love surprise guests, we don't always love to be the guest who's surprised. <laughs> But this is important, and uh, the role that George Jepson played, bringing people together across the aisle, and each and every one of you. And uh, it's just a reminder, hearing Marty talk about it was politically courageous, and also, in some cases, um, courageous in terms of the reaction that people had. And uh, it makes a difference. I think what you guys did 30 years ago makes a difference. We, every day, we have to continue to build upon that legacy, and uh, that's what we're trying to do. Uh, you know recently in the House and soon to be in the Senate. I'm just reminded here in this history that, you know, FDR tried to ban machine guns back during those very dangerous days in the 30s. And then after the assassination of the Kennedys and Martin Luther King, there were some halting gun safety bills. And after the attempted assassination of President Reagan, you had the Brady Bill that made a difference, had some bipartisan support. 
uh, 30 years ago, uh, Connecticut being one of the leaders when it came to gun safety. And um, Chris Murphy being uh, one of the people there was now taking that to Washington, D.C. and showing that what's working in Connecticut and some of our neighboring states can work around the country. And, uh, and it works. I think you heard um, Mike say in no uncertain terms uh, that we are a safer state uh, because of these laws. And it's clearly demonstrable. We've got to build upon that. Uh, Dan Malloy built upon that after Sandy Hook, thanks to a lot of the folks who are in the legislature again, continuing to uh, strengthen our laws. And uh, we're trying to get that done again. It reminds me of two things. A, you never declare a victory. You never declare a victory on civil rights or civil liberties or economic justice. Every day is in order to build a more perfect union. And uh, the world changes, and we've got to maintain our gun safety laws so they're current to what's going on right now. That's why we have a bill in front that's passed uh, with strong bipartisan support in the House, and Marty's going to get it done in the Senate. I know that. You know, really important in terms of what we're doing on, um, you know, those illegal ghost guns on the street that are causing such havoc. Uh, what we're doing to make sure that um, those assault weapons that are purchased pre-1993 are registered, and nobody can bring in hundreds of pre-93 assault weapons, bring them into our state. They're going to be registered, and they're going to be controlled, and we're going to keep people safe. And every day, as progressives, you stand up, and progress means you work at it every day to make a little bit of progress. I think Connecticut has led the way on gun safety, thanks to the people behind me. Thanks to uh, Lowell Weicker, who stood up uh, loud and clear. Thanks to John Larson, who was there as well. Sort of interesting where everybody is 30 years later, still making a difference. And uh, in our state Senate, we're going to be able to make a difference um, within the next few days. And Connecticut will always be a leader on gun safety. One last thing. Thank you to Moms Demand Action. You remind us every day how important it is, what we're doing. And we will continue to take the lead, remembering you. So let me finally say, since the governor mentioned something I was going to mention, Moms Demand Action, Connecticut Coalition Against Gun Violence, all the national groups. What's different today than 30 years ago is the engagement of ordinary citizens, moms, young people. We saw this down in Parkland, Florida. It is extraordinary how much energy is behind this. People are not going to tolerate this gun violence any longer. It's going to be a heavy lift. Connecticut's leading the way, as we always have. And with that in mind, go out and get this bill passed in the State Senate. Thank you, everybody. I, we will, uh, working with, uh, of course, obviously, we were going to take that bill up. Uh, we know it'll be a, an extended uh, debated bill, as it was in the House. but. Uh, but that really doesn't matter. Whatever time it takes, we'll devote to it. Uh, we're still working on our goal list for today, but there are still a few Senate bills that we have to get done, you know, before we start concentrating on all of the House bills. Do you but, think it will be more of a challenge with some of the new members that you have now? Or less? I don't think it'll be more or less for new or older members. I think there's broad-based support for this. I hope it'll be. Uh, I hope it'll be a bipartisan vote, as it was in the. Uh, uh, as it was in in the House, both the the 93 and the 2013 bills were both uh, both bipartisan. As we said, the 2013 bill in the wake of Sandy Hook was even more uh, bipartisan. In, in 93, it was about 75 percent of the Democrats voting yes, and about 25 percent of the Republicans. In 2013, it was about 90 percent of the Democrats and 40 percent of the Republicans. But but they were both bipartisan. Do you have, do you have a, a vote count? I mean, you, have you have you caucused? Have you counted heads? Do you have a majority of Democratic senators or all Democrats? The votes will be there. Good answer. <laughs> Good. Governor, uh, what do you think of that? I like it. Take Marty at his word. <laughs> I, I don't think Susan will have to break your tie this time. No. That's right. I know. She'll I, be there. I keep waiting for that moment, but so far with 24 <laughs> out of 36, I haven't had that opportunity. But, uh, you know, Governor, could I ask you, I mean, we already have uh, two pending federal lawsuits challenging the constitutionality of um, the uh, existing law. Um, do you expect after you plan to sign this bill that there'll be uh, another challenge? 
What are your thoughts on that? Probably. There are a lot of out-of-staters who love to sue us, and that happens when we're doing the right thing. Here we're doing the right thing. We're going to continue to push the envelope. I think uh, Attorney General Tong and others have opined on this. We feel very confident we'll withstand any legal challenges and keep Connecticut safe. We have been sued after the 93 bill passed by the NRA types. Um, and, uh, and they sued in state court because the Connecticut Constitution has much stronger um, gun ownership rights than, than the federal, certainly at, at that time. So it went up to the state Supreme Court who ruled, yes, there is this protection that citizens, and interesting, only citizens have the right to, uh, to uh, have arms in their defense but the court ruled the legislature using its police powers can define what is and isn't a defensive weapon. And here we had military style assault weapons. And so uh, it, uh, it stood uh, a very strong uh, uh, court case. So I'm feeling very optimistic. One, one piece of trivia about the United States Supreme Court, you know, last year they handed down a decision called Bruin which appeared to, uh, I don't know, emphasize or articulate a specific right to keep and bear arms. Uh, that was a challenge to a New York state law. In that decision, in the first footnote, the Supreme Court majority singles out Connecticut as the right way to regulate access to firearms. Because in Connecticut, every citizen is entitled to a permit to possess firearms but the state can deny it based on evidence that the person is not a suitable person. So our uh, formula, our scheme has been approved already by the United States Supreme Court. And I was very happy to see that, but I, 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 that's the way I've always felt, like this is the right way to do it, and Connecticut leads the nation in reasonable, common sense gun regulations. It did, but it said Connecticut is the way to do it. It said states should do it like, well, it says states should do it like Connecticut does it. I understand, but I'm going to find out in the next, in these pending court cases, whether or not Connecticut's laws stand that new test. Um, I think they already said we passed the test, actually, so. Former Attorney General could opine on that. Thank you, guys. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody.